Hello there and welcome back to the Agostino Zynga show with I, your host, Agostino Zynga, and this is episode number 607. That's 607 of the Agostino Zynga show and I hope you're doing well wherever this show may find you at this very moment. It could be in bed, it could be out and about, it could be on the way to work, it could be in a shop somewhere, it could be running for your life down a really dark alleyway or you try to escape your perpetrator. But wherever it may be, I hope you will end up doing well. I hope you will end up doing well. How am I? Pretty decent, all things considered. I'm recording this sometime in the evening after United played Everton away from home, and we ended up scraping a 2 1 victory um, from the jaws of you know relative defeat. So I'm pretty happy about that. The performance wasn't the greatest, don't get me wrong, but just seeing our team essentially come back from being a goal down, respond well take risk and just essentially try to correct the errors of the previous minutes that passed was really good to see there's definitely been a change in the mentality of the squad I think most of the change will happen when you know Eric Ten Hag our new manager ends up being able to get rid of the players he wants to get rid of I think that's usually the main thing because it's difficult to change people's minds who are already there it's probably best to just start anew which probably explains why a lot of CEOs and big companies decide to just come in and make sweeping changes when they come and take over and Instead of trying to, um, what's that word? Instead of trying to, instead of trying to maybe train or develop the people that already exist, just go and get new people and then start from refresh because there's no way you can change the old ones and it takes just too much time. So once Eric Ten Hag gets his own players, I'm sure things will change for the better. But it's still just painful to watch us considering other teams and what they're doing at the moment. We obviously stuff. We obviously I saw earlier on today um, Arsenal make a bit of a statement and basically beat um, Liverpool, um, a team who I think they've effectively taken the place off of being the kind of legit title contenders for City even though maybe the season is a bit too close or near for them I feel like they're definitely in contention to see where they've taken things and they have pretty crappy owners too not as bad as the Glazers you know but they're still pretty bad and the fact that they are doing what they're doing at the moment kind of you know is a bit upsetting because it basically means we are even further away because we have to catch up with them we have to catch up with Chelsea's and whatnot and then we can finally catch up to Man City so we're probably still another five or ten years away from actually legitimately challenging for trophies on a consistent basis which again is really sobering for United fan and myself who obviously saw us play amazingly well for the majority of my life and win you know at ease really so to see that is kind of a bit sad but you know what can you do what can you do Apart from that, what have I been up to? I've been up to loads of interesting things, to be fair. Um, I ended up going to uh, Printworks the other day, which was pretty decent. The first time I've ever been to that nightclub here in the UK. And it's probably one of our better establishments. Um, there was a bit of bad news earlier on this year when they announced that they were going to knock it down. And, you know, it wasn't really... I don't think they stressed the importance of it or they didn't really emphasize it. I felt like, I felt like they kind of just, you know, let people just interpret what they wanted to interpret. But allegedly according to them it was always meant to be a temporary space it was always meant to be a space where they kind of took over in between the whoever bought the site deciding what they could do or getting permission to build on that land it was always meant to be like a temporary sort of situation which i had no idea about they announced it's temporary or, or anyway they're going to have to kind of leave there now because the you know the, the the builders are ready to or what you call it the construction's ready to happen in terms of chain turning it into another co-working space another block of offices another group of random stores you know just nonsense stuff right but anything cultural that's actually contributing to that local community get rid of it let's stick another shop there let's stick another building made out of glass and metal so pretty boring and then they announced a slew of shows to kind of close it off. And if I'm not mistaken, the show that we went to, which was Trans Madonna, which is Dixon's sort of like um, immersive club experience where he kind of, you know, integrates loads of cool V, uh, they're called VJs, right? Loads of cool video stuff, loads of cool um, AI stuff, loads of cool AR stuff. Um, loads of cool virtual reality stuff and he kind of integrates it into this whole big immersive type of experience and because printworks is pretty immersive in its own right because you have to kind of walk a bit of a distance to get to it then there's this whole kind of you know journey you have to go through to get searched and to put your car in the locker go up the stairs blah, blah blah it's a little bit of a labyrinth in itself yeah no pun intended so um it kind of adds to the whole you know immersive experience thing so it made sense why he wanted to do it at that place and um, it was pretty decent for what it is, don't get me wrong. And I'll definitely do a full review of it later. But it was a little bit, you know, um, a little bit 
a little bit. It flattered to deceive a tiny bit, but it was decent. I'm not going to lie, just to be able to go into space and see what it's like. Because I'm a big, you know, it's kind of a, a mute point to make, but there's something about me that kind of just wants to always see things for myself. I want to just have a view of it, take it in. Even if I don't like it, cool, but I want to just put my own eyes on it because people love to kind of put you off on things. Because I feel like sometimes when people say, oh, this place is shit, that place is good, or no, this place is shit usually, I feel like they do it in a way to kind of like humble brag that they've been there and you haven't and to also hope that their word has some sort of influence in your decision making process like their recommendation is that crucial or is that important that it's going to sway you to not go it's going to be the final thing oh you know what i was planning my whole summer holidays around going to this place but now i've just had this one random conversation with you after we've had a couple of bumps in the toilet that i'm now not going to go nah it's never like that so i never really enjoy that sort of thing when people say that kind of thing i always kind of if anything it kind of it kind of um cemented my resolve to go even for even more so but um yeah what can you do so i ended up going to that that was pretty decent um, what else I ended up doing that's about it for the most part working going to gym as per usual um, of course Sober October still on so I've got to be cracking on with that so it's been a pretty nice one to be fair but I'll definitely crack on with more of it later on as I kind of proceed and let you know what my deal was in the event but apart from that one other thing I wanted to quickly mention I thought was interesting in terms of ca- top, you know, catching up on top of the club stuff Obviously, with Sober October, I'm kind of, you know, abstaining from the drugs and the alcohol. And with myself being an avid fan of clubs and of dance music and me being a DJ myself, you would imagine or, you know, it's safe to it's safe to assume that drugs and alcohol are, are kind of intrinsically linked to my clubbing experience and the things I do and how I enjoy them. And for me, it's not it's not been so difficult to quit it because I've done it quite often because I, you know, used to DJ quite regularly. Now it's kind of, you know, it's been a bit of a stop start thing since the pandemic for various reasons. But before when I was DJing quite often and I was kind of going out quite often, I kind of um, decided of my own volition to be like, OK, cool, I need to like pencil in a couple of months in the year where I just abstain from everything. And usually it'd be the, the typical bait one. So it'd be dry January and it'd be like a October, sober October type of thing. And I kind of have those in between and then of course in between those months the thing I was always really fortunate about I think maybe because you know I was brought up in the household where there was really a lot of alcohol in the household there wasn't any actually and then I guess because I was in the church for so long when I did finally move out and get my own place I didn't really have the habit of like drinking a lot anyway so when I did it would only be when I go out which obviously I still do it to an excessive amount because I'm British and we don't have a middle gro- middle gear but I think that kind of helped me in terms of not really like you know how some people really like booze i do don't get me wrong but it's more so as an accompaniment to go out it's not like i like the taste of it like i like i don't know pineapples and shit do you know what i mean it's not like that because if it was like that i'd be in a i'd be in a much worse place i think so to quit it and to abstain from it isn't so difficult the only difficult part of it is obviously the activities that are linked to it so stuff like clubbing so you go out clubbing and stuff you're used to having a drink in your hand you're used to having you know whatever recreational drugs in your pocket to go and give yourself a boost later on in the night so it's quite difficult to get your head around that but because I had that training and that kind of prep before where I was DJing so often I was going so often I had to introduce those little safeguards to make it not crazy so I'd kind of you know put those safeguards in place be like okay cool if I go out this time I'm not going to drink this or I'm not going to do that I did these little things I did so it kind of had let me balance so when i come to doing a full 30 day or 31 day or whatever it may be cleanse i can do it pretty easily but one thing that i have to kind of stress stress here this is very very important is that people don't say it's often enough but like let's be real going to a rave and raving in general sober is boring it's probably one of the most boring things you could ever do even if you're a fan of the music like i am even if you're a fan of the djs like like i am even if you're a fan of the scene and the culture like i am even if you're a fan of the club space and just seeing clubs and how they operate and how they function like i am it's still bloody boring to be in a space full of drunken high people with really loud music bright lights smoke everywhere and you're not under any sort of level of drunkenness or highness it really is difficult but one thing it does do, I think, is that it should reaffirm your love for the music. Because there's no reason why you'd be there apart from listening to somebody play records, right? Which is a pleasure in itself, especially if it's these high level people, like I saw like a Dixon play, right? People who have been playing on the highest level for like, you know, two decades plus, um, you know, flipping a hundred shows per year. Like you can imagine, you know, he's way exceeded his 10,000 hours. So his ability to just 
take you on this journey on an eight hour set six hour set four hour set it's unparalleled like you're probably never gonna see that level of fucking performance in your life do you know what I mean especially for the stuff that you actually enjoy because you know you're going home you listen to the mixes you're watching clips of him on Arm to Dixon you're seeing clips on his own Instagram page so you're familiar with what he plays anyway and then he's playing the stuff you listen to in your crappy headphones on big massive speakers you know with all these cool people around with all these cool you know visuals and whatnot it is definitely going to do something to you so if you can do that and be somewhat sober it's definitely a better thing to do but as an overall club experience is it is it something that i would maybe encourage probably not you probably you could probably best serve using your time doing other things that can maybe get you in, you know involved as well at maybe a higher level like maybe producing music or just learning how to dj properly i don't know whatever maybe or just doing other things in your life in general i don't think spending time in club sober legitimately is probably the best use of anyone's time i don't think so personally because you notice everything i mean you notice people stepping on you you notice people barging you you notice how wet the floor is how sticky it is how wet just everything is in general you go to lean on the bar to order a drink your whole sleeve is wet um you go to go to the toilet you step in something is that piss is that is that somebody's phlegm is that nose juice or is that just water you have no idea <laughs> you know what i mean so that kind of thing can kind of not help but it probably is good for the interactions. That's the one thing I say. I think every interaction that I had there, um, especially for the ones that I can remember, were definitely good. Um, it didn't feel like I was, you know, holding onto somebody's arm and just shouting at them about some football thing or about something I saw on the internet or trying to explain a meme in real life. Like, no, it was just me having a kind of a passing conversation with people. And I did have a few of those. I bumped into a few old school friends and stuff. So that was quite nice to see those kind of people um in a somewhat together state instead of seeing them flipping half drunk with one high hanging out in your pockets all smashed up in your face you know leaking or sweat like you're super high in that that's nice to see that so that was good um but apart from that you know it probably isn't the best use of anyone's time but the one thing i do say that i think is really important if you are going to go out and you're going to rave a lot i think one big change that a lot of people can make i think many people especially in the uk because we have a real difficult relationship with alcohol right I feel like going out and not drinking alcohol is maybe the biggest game changer that's ever going to be introduced to your clubbing um, experience. Um, I think doing drugs is one thing because like I think, you know, in general, especially if you go out the places I go out, unless you're doing speed or something, which is, you know, re relatively cheap, for the most part, everything that you're going to be taking, you've paid some amount of money for. It's not going to, it's not going to be cheap. It's going to be 50 pounds plus, 30 pounds plus, whatever it may be. So you're only going to have a... Um, you know uh, a finite amount of money or time or resources or places to go to get that stuff right so once you've done you're basically done until you get to an after or something so and also you know the effects aren't that you know the effects kind of reach hit, hit a wall you can be chasing a dragon for a while but usually they hit a wall but i feel like with drinking for whatever reason you just crave more and you can just keep going until you basically sleep so if you can cut that out of your if you can cut that out of what you do when you go out it will help immensely with your pocket. And number two, the next day the hangovers aren't that bad. Even if you're on drugs, even if you just do drugs and you just drink Coca-Cola and water and stuff, or maybe just water, forget the Coca-Cola, you'll be perfectly fine in the next day. And it's a real big, and again, it takes a lot of effort to do because if you're used to, like I am, to pre-gaming and, you know, getting a couple of drinks in before, getting a flipping magnum on the way there, then maybe you go off the station, you see another shop, get another, I mean, you're used to that, what's what I'm kind of used to, like every place that you kind of get off of a public transport thing or everywhere you walk and you see a shop, you basically grab another drink. It's basically like you're on like a weird, you know, off-license flipping beer run or pub, you know, off-license beer crawl or something like that, right? So I feel like the level above that is to just go out and not do anything, right? Not do any in terms of drinking and just do the drugs if you if need be. But I just don't see a future for myself where I'm going out completely sober and not drinking and not doing any drugs if I'm not playing. I think if I'm playing, it'd be different. If I'm DJing and I'm the one at the at the place performing, it's totally different because that's when you're in like kind of artist mode, performance mode. And really and truly, I feel like, you know, to perform at your highest anyway, you should have no liquor, no drugs in your system at whatsoever, zero. The only way to connect with your audience to really kind of, especially when it comes to DJing, because it's sort of like a call and response type of occupation. It's not really, but it kind of is because you're kind of playing to the crowd um, to kind of you're trying to take them on a journey, but you also want to feel their vibe and you know make sure that everything that you're playing kind of fits what's kind of going on in the room or even if you do the opposite you still have to know what they're feeling right um if you're gonna throw a little wrench in there you still have to know what they're feeling to kind of take it the other side and maybe clear the dance floor 
But the only way you can do that is if your receptors, your kind of um, emotion um, and vibe, you know, receptors are sort of like tingling and working. But once you take drugs and do alcohol, they sort of like dim a little bit and you don't really receive that energy and vibe too tough. So being so somewhat sober in that regard definitely helps. But I'm just not too sure if, if, if it's a good long term strategy to do you know especially for your ear health all that sort of stuff just completely sober just going raving and, just, and also just for like a waste of time it really does and you end up getting agitated end up hating humans or you end up like me like you know looking at people and taking a piss out of them in your head like all those things can happen as well and then of course but the one good thing about it when you are sober is that you notice things so i was standing you know in flipping print works just listening to the music and kind of zoning out and staring into the abyss and i noticed one guy had climbed up on one of the speakers i think if you're familiar with pretty much you would know there's a stack of speakers they have on each side of the little you know gangway where the main print works is and they're sort of like a stack of speakers but they're sort of encased in this cage i guess to keep them set on top all over but it's a cool little design as well and this guy i guess climbed up that entire thing got up to the top of the speakers and started doing handstands like handstand push-ups handstand and then cycling his wheel his feet around and at first we all thought it was a performer because i think during the during one bit of Dixon's performance, he had like a um I guess you would call him burlesque or like a striptease kind of dancer on the pole doing crazy moves on the pole and stuff, right? And it was really cool because it kind of matched the vibe of music, blah 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 blah. So we thought that guy was part of it, but obviously when I clearly looked closer, he wasn't because he was just you know some dudes in some tracksuits and trainers and his boxers out, so he clearly wasn't. And then by the time he got up to the top and the security got a hold of him, you know. It, it, I, thought, I thought it might turn into a flipping um, George Floyd situation, mate, because they were putting all kinds of arms, knees, and elbows on him. So that was a bit sad to see. But, you know, again, when you're sober, you see those kind of things. I guess when you're drunk, you're just such in your own vibe, such in your own world. You don't notice any of those sort of type of things. The only thing you notice is how, how long you haven't been to a toilet or something. You know what I mean? So that's a big one. So big up. All of those included, big up all of those people included. I happened to bump into because I had an absolute blast. I had an absolute blast. So next thing I want to quickly touch upon, um, which I didn't mention before, which I'm a bit ashamed I didn't actually, is happy birthday to Virgil Abloh. That's a belated birthday because it happened on the 30th. And um, yeah, man. Uh, gone but never forgotten it does it doesn't feel like it happened flipping in 2021 when he passed but it's, it's already nearly been a year already coming up in december that he passed which is flipping tragic to say the least especially off the back of all this recent stuff happening now with kanye going on the tear and stuff but regardless of that put that to one side for now definitely r.i.p and happy birthday to virgil Ablo. um definitely a big i say influence in the things that i've done and obviously somebody who i've been who i was lucky enough to meet for a very brief time in a previous workplace that I was at in terms of putting together an online streetwear course and he was a pleasure to deal with so that's definitely something that I'll remember him for but one thing that I kind of wanted to say in terms of you know honoring his birthday and kind of like a little story time from me was that um, when I was at this place that I was at prior and I was kind of helping to co-produce the entire online streetwear program that we had, which was basically aimed at loads of emerging brands who wanted to take the next step up. And the idea behind it was to take you from like PDF to like shop rail, right? That was kind of my thesis or my kind of um, um, theme that I had in my head from it, right? Take you from a PDF to shop rail. And obviously some of you guys will know, um, I'm a big hater of people designers or brands that just show you line sheets and don't show you actual physical physical product right because i feel like the physical product is like you putting your money where your mouth is making a sample even print screen printing it even just like putting a bit of heat transfer paper you've gone through that effort of reversing the image printing all that sort of stuff just to kind of prove your concept and it kind of gives me a bit more faith as a prospective customer that you're going to follow through i feel like the pdf stuff is just like you kind of crowdsourcing approval and it's also kind of a weird procrastination thing right it's like you just you know yeah just put it out there so I wanted to create a program that I would have liked growing up because I've also been a serial procrastinator which is why I hate it usually the things you hate are the things that you kind of see in yourself so I wanted to do that thing and have it to be PDF to retail and at the time I was really really obsessed with kind of that whole crew right Ben Trill Heron Preston I kind of knew you know from afar uh, Matthew Williams of course and Virgil and I kind of saw his journey and I always thought he was the I always thought Virgil was the kind of best kind of archetype or best sort of person for a kid to growing up to follow because I think we can all agree now even in his passing we could all be honest and say he wasn't maybe the greatest designer in the world in terms of execution but the one thing he was good 
was his execution, right? In terms of him actually getting things done. He got things done. Um, there was always a theme, a reasoning behind it. It was probably way deeper than what we actually saw on the final garment. And maybe we didn't give him enough credit for it because we didn't like the designs overall. But there was always a thought and intention and an idea that went back into it. And he just got things out there. And it's no surprise that brands would want to queue up to work with him collaboration-wise because they saw his work ethic. He wasn't someone that kind of, you know, shirked working even where i was at he would fly to these places at last minute notice be flying back and forth from chicago with his family to come and film with us for a bit then fly to london then fly to, fly to milan to do off-white stuff like he was everywhere and he clearly somebody like you saw like he kind of enjoyed the he kind of enjoyed the influence of lifestyle which i think you are meant to which I think a lot of people kind of, um, what's that word called? They romanticize that influencer journey, right? The idea of like, oh yeah, you've made it now. You've kind of, you know, shown at this gallery, you've got this representation, you're going to be showing a film at this place, um, at this film in fair, you're going to be, you know, maybe doing a collaboration with this brand. But then when you suddenly get there, it can be a bit daunting, right? All the pressures that you need to do, especially if you're a designer, the resort collections, the capsule collections, the collaborations, the media obligations, all this stuff can kind of get a bit too heavy. But I always felt like with Virgil, like he was made for that. Do you know what I mean? He looked forward to it. The more he was, the more he was given, the more kind of it reaffirmed that he finally had made it. And I think I remember even saying one finally time, one time in an interview about he knew he kind of slightly made it too when he saw his stuff being copied on like places like Tab Out and stuff, right? Like off-white stuff was like reselling or the people selling fake versions of those, of the flipping belt that I've got on there as on that kind of stuff. So that's really something I kind of saw in him that was cool. But another thing that I really did like, obviously, and obviously just time with the streetwear program, sorry, that I was putting together, I always thought he'd be the perfect person to kind of lead it. And it was funny because when I applied for the role at that place, I wasn't aware that they were going to even start a streetwear program. So I I kind of applied because I liked what they were doing because they were doing other programs, you know, within the industry. They were doing hair and makeup. They were doing also doing hair, hair and makeup, photography and other things. And I just wanted to get involved, basically, because I thought it was cool. And, um, you know, to kind of give back and whatever, maybe I lend my hand that way. And obviously it was a thing that maybe allowed me to be like still fashion adjacent without being in it because I was going for a little bit of a hate and love it of the industry sort of thing. But I still wanted to be involved. So that was a perfect thing. And then I remember when I went to the interview, my kind of you had we got set we had to do this presentation thing where we had to kind of like you know um what if we were going to do a course what would it be and i obviously picked street because that's something that i kind of you know i've loved from day dot and um i picked for the course leader funny enough virgil ablo that's who i picked in the course leader thing so it was funny when i was presenting my ideas I was doing the whole thing and I was really going through an interview and really kind of showing my stuff and showing my little flipping keynote that I had presented with all these little funny graphs and charts and flow of things and illustrations of how people could do and book recommendations and, you know, ways of thinking, blah, blah, blah. And at the end, they're like, yeah, you got it. Because essentially, you know, I kind of had already written half of the program in those kind of slides that I presented because they already had Virgil signed up. So that was pretty sick. And then of course, getting to meet him was also awesome as well. And yeah, man, I, I had a great time working with him. But one of the things I can kind of really claim that I fucking think was a real kind of feather in his cap that he kind of allowed me to basically enjoy and something that kind of gave me the inspiration to kind of, I don't know, continue on with this flipping fashion thing, even though it's kind of, it's kind of maybe a bit, bit disillusioned sometimes here and there was definitely my first ever, ever fashion show experience. Like going to see one was when I went to see this collection here on screen, which is the Off-White 4 2016 menswear collection. And if you're not aware of this, this is the one collection where the, the infamous picture, the famous picture of um, Ian Connor and Virgil running down the, the the runway together, holding hands and stuff, I think arms around each other. That's where that famous picture came from when I was there. Um, and it was my first ever fashion week to go to, no, my first ever sorry, fashion show. I've been to a fashion week before. I've been outside and at loitering, but I've never been to an actual legit show. And um, it was interesting because I'm pretty sure, yeah, I am pretty sure that maybe a year before that I went for something else. I forgot what I went for and I had a horrible time. And I think I'm, it kind of reminded me why I didn't really like Paris as a city. I thought our city is overrated, it's fucking shit. Then I go a second time of with the invitation of Off-White. Um, I also have the ability to go to the after party. I also have the ability to go to see showrooms and also have to be just to be around, right? I didn't meet anybody. I didn't have any friends there. I didn't even even meet Virgil at the time there, but I just was around, right? Because you're so busy and I wasn't really trying to, you know, grab him for anything. But 
just to experience that and being around that ambiance of a show, it changed my entire perspective of that city overall. And it made me love it all together. And I've def definitely saw and understood why some people would say Paris is one of those cities where you kind of have to, even if you don't know people, just being around the people who know people can kind of help you enjoy the city a bit better. And I definitely loved it. I remember one thing that kind of sticks out the most is just me walking around that city for like hours on end, listening to music, going to record different bookstores um you know stopping off at d different bars and restaurants to have wine and shit like i even remember buying a fucking pack of cigarettes also you know ingratiated in the space that i was in at the time also all the location i was in and i don't smoke so that was flipping you know hilarious to come back with a flipping raspy voice coughing at my asshole because i've attempted to be a core parisian guy and start smoking and shit um but the show itself i remember it being like in an area that was kind of near the hood so that was decent to see because i'd never seen that before when i went to paris i'd always stay in the middle and you know or the, the kind of the inner ring so when you start going towards the outer rings is when you start to see a lot more brown and black faces and that was pretty cool to see that and to see how the energy and the vibe changes completely when you go in those sort of spaces so that was quite cool and then to go to the after party was nice as well um to see the people taking street style pictures outside the show was freaking sick and just to be at the show itself and see models running walking down the runway had it organized shit all of that was fucking eye-opening it really fucking was and i think in overall too especially these early collections before like you know he was really in his bag i thought these early collections from virgil especially this one i went to go see where maybe he's like best interpretation of what he was trying to go for off white at the time that he was around because i always thought to myself like why does it look so unpolished and unfinished and just a little bit off and then i remember having this kind of main this kind of um this revelation that maybe he wasn't even going for the whole like I want to be Karl Lagerfeld mid thing. Maybe obviously we saw that because of his output and the amount of projects he was working on. But maybe he was trying to present his looks or what he viewed fashion to be in more so a Jun Takahashi model and with undercover. Because I feel like there's nothing that links any undercover collection to the previous one. They're all just different. It's like they're different movies, right? They're, they're, they're basically characters of different movies um, that there is to doing. But there's nothing that ties in. There's no prequel. It's not a sequel. It's just various different looks. And I feel like that's what he was kind of going for when he was designing his men's. Every show was the opportunity to like play around with another world, um, explore different themes, um, different ideas, whatever it may be. And it's just kind of build upon something. But there was nothing that tied any of them together. Zero nothing i don't think so actually that might be the debut of the actual um harness belt you know the much derided one which is strange because i still got mine because that's the one i was you know personally given by him but i don't know why this is hated so much this yellow belt it's really interesting he went from being something that was incredibly cool for like a really short minute and then suddenly just like went out of corners so now when you wear it people look at you and think you're corny even though i like to wear it because i think it's a cool little personal tribute that i kind of have you know for myself but people look at it and really deride it they kind of look down upon you if you actually have that belt which is fucking strange because at one time it was legitimately one of the coolest belts you could wear then it kind of just suddenly went out of flavor or maybe it never was i'm not too sure but i remember in my little um you know my little world it definitely was and it kind of went out of favor straight away but i definitely think he was maybe aiming more to be like a john takahashi with undercover than he was maybe trying to be Karl lagerfeld with his various different brands that he was working at all the same time and of course that's the famous picture there of virgil and ian connor running down the uh, the runway at the end there looking absolutely pleased with himself so that was pretty decent and sick to see in real life right so definitely something that i kind of have to thank virgil for because i think without him i definitely would have gone because i'm never going to make the effort to try and apply for a ticket i'm not emailing anybody i'm not trying to enter a raffle i don't give a fuck about all that stuff I'm not liking your comments or leaving a comment on instagram to get a ticket no thank you um so the fact that i was invited to go because of the work that i was doing because obviously we were working with him to see it firsthand was fucking sick i took some pictures added it to a blog that we did internally that you know probably no one saw but it was cool just for me to go there and kind of ingratiate myself in it and you know essentially reawaken my quote-unquote passion for fashion it definitely did because it allowed me to see what it is like actually working in it kind of day to day right the kind of fun of it of being around this thing that you legitimately live for the stuff that you kind of obsess about uh, and to kind of see it all there was really 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 cool to see so um definitely something that i don't take for granted in the slightest and definitely something that i was kind of really privileged to kind of enjoy at that certain time and definitely something that i will kind of remember um bit mr big va for until the end of time so definitely belated happy birthday to that man in it because he definitely helped me with that one i'm not gonna lie he definitely helped me with that one 
So moving on from that quickly, I want to touch upon this decent news regarding a New York City institution in this short time. Brooklyn's Bossa Nova Civic Club has reopened after nine months being closed due to a fire. Imagine how mad that was. And if I'm not mistaken, New York suffered just as much or probably the same level as we did in terms of the crazy and tyrannical flipping COVID restrictions and shit when it comes to um, the entertainment industry, hospitality and all that bad stuff, right? All that nighttime stuff. It suffered really badly a lot of people were kind of struggling a lot of the places closed a lot of the places didn't reopen again people had to move different jobs had people to go and benefits and whatnot it was really horrible and obviously bossa nova civic club is one of the premier clubs out there in terms of dance music and they were going for a bad time anyway and then on top of that they have a fire and then they have to close and kind of repair the whole thing and all the money that's going to be done in terms of rebuilding it and whatnot and you don't know there's no guarantee as i've said here in the uk we have i've said before like you know i've been going out for a long time i've been djing for a long time and i can definitely tell you that it's different out there it's not the same the clubbing space has changed there's not as many people out anymore um it feels like the events just aren't as electric as they once were probably some djs don't travel anymore because of covid they've permanently changed their flipping decision making process i know when i went to see todd turge play somewhere at like an undisclosed location i won't mention he was being re this was during like the you know maybe the slow the, the end of like the code restrictions he was being really finicky and picky about playing out um, and he's really kind of self-conscious and paranoid to the point where he asked the promoter that he was playing for to place a fan directly in front of him um to kind of you know help blow away or whatever and he was in a full mask with gloves on and shit playing so i think a lot of people you know he was maybe brave in his kind of mind to take the flight and come and play even though he's getting paid for it i think other djs have just decided no i'm going to play domestically or somewhere i can maybe travel to on a train or something but no plane so that maybe has affected you know the clubbing space too because people don't get to see the best people in the world because some people don't want to travel you just only see whoever can be bothered to come to your area um so maybe all that stuff is affecting so you're not too sure if you're bossing up a civic club when you do reopen after nine months do you even have an audience to cater to is the community still there have they changed their interest have they moved on have they evolved have they grown up whatever you don't know so the fact they've been able to open up to some relative level of success i feel like from what i've seen online from the clips instagram and stuff is pretty sick to see and i'm really happy for them I'm not going to lie Anyway, this article courtesy of DJ Mag explains a bit more. It says Brooklyn's venue, Boston Nova Civic Club, has reopened after nine months of inaction. The venue returned this past weekend with a lineup that included Julian Huxtable, who I saw in Bergheim, and she was fucking sick. Kind of said, went up to say hi to her, and it didn't go well. I would say I think she thought I was trying to hit on her or something. I don't know. It just didn't go well. The, or maybe no, didn't. It, it, I wouldn't say that. Let me, let me not put that on her. I think I had a different idea of how it would go in my head. Yeah, I mean, I think that's why I had a different film playing and she was not even watching TV. She was just like minding her business. I think that's basically what happened, but I saw her play. She's fucking awesome. Uh, Beer Cat I'm not familiar with. Oh, actually, maybe I am. Maybe Beer Cat is a person who people were, were ripping into on social media at that time, back in the day. Not back in the day, during the beginning of the pandemic about some boiler room mix that was terrible. I think she complained about someone else playing and people linked to her. Oh, was this you clanging or something? I don't know. Anyway, some person called Beer Cat. I think that might be the person. I'm not sure if it isn't. I apologize. Someone called Honey Dip and someone called Devoy. Devoy. Is it Devoy or Devoy? Devoy. Devoy. I'm not sure how you pronounce that person's name, but I apologize. It continues said the club was forced to close at the start of the year after sustaining damage due to a fire in the building that houses the venue. While the fire in the building on the third floor did not reach the ground floor where the club is situated, the venue faced what was described at the time as a tremendous amount of damage. Yeah, I remember seeing the water. Ma mad pipes would burst everywhere. Speaking to DJ Mag's boss and owner, John Barkley, sounds super normal, isn't it? For to own such a, a very eclectic and diverse in history kind of diverse uh, div uh, ethnically diverse racially diverse club to be just called john barkley anyway i feel surreal he says to have the venue open again he quote he says we didn't think it was gonna happen the opening night was pandemonium and we had a line down the block sign at 9 p.m so you can clearly see there was an appetite to go out to that nightclub and party and from what i've seen online people talk about i think the, the real evidence or the real kind of sign you've got a great club on your hands is when people say the name. I guess the name is really cool, Boston Nova Civic Club. That kind of helps. But you hate, I hear people say the name more than I hear people say that about the club nights or about who's playing. So clearly it's one of those spots that you can go to just say, you know what, 
I'm deciding to go here on a Friday, Saturday night, whatever else, and it's going to be fun. You're just going to take whoever's playing on the night. And I think that's usually a sign of a good club because if you can get people to just to come off the strength of just the name of your club and the vibe you get, and on top of that, you do end up booking good people, smash out the park. It continues. Trailing what club goers can expect from the opening weekend, he added, we are looking forward to doing what we've always been doing from the past decade, offering the citizens of Brooklyn and the globe mind-melting dance music, world music cocktails, and top-notch customer service with a smile and affordable price tag seven nights a week. I love that saying. That's a good kind of um, bio to put in it, in any club. Um, another person called Tigapore, Liche, Safira, um, Julian, how do you spell that? Julie Lenton, I think, physical therapy, who I know, Aku, Aurora Halau, I know, are among the guest DJs who are lined up to play at the venue in the coming weeks. Keep up to date with the kind over there. I'm actually going to click the location on Instagram and see if we can see if somebody uploaded a the video there because that's always good because now they have that flipping location search thing um, reenacted back on Instagram. The thing I actually love because it's to give you an opportunity to be a bit of a voyeur and check clubs out before you actually go there to see what the vibe is. So, this is definitely going to be great to see. Um, and see what was saying over there so we can definitely see if um, the vibe is as immaculate as it always is over a place like that so what can we see here we see videos of flyers we see maybe a bit of the inside here with this post on instagram someone posted five days ago you can definitely see that it's back filling up and people are ready to go but so far no one video to show me what it actually was like on a dance floor i'd like to see it if possible come on brother give me something Nothing, no, nothing so far. No one video to show us what the vibe is saying. But so far, what we can see, it looks pretty decent. People look like they're having some semblance of fun in there. I'm not going to lie, but so far, no actual video. But yeah, what's this pitch post here? I think this is when the fire actually happened, right? In January 19th. Look at that, all covered in shit and damaged. Bloody hell, mate. So a lot of damage to be done and that, especially if it's an old building, there's a tendency for them to say, oh, just knock it down and start again. So it probably wasn't super simple to just keep going. So definitely um, great to see them back on fighting form and hopefully they go from strength to strength from now on in. That's all we want to see. That's all we want to see. Moving on from that. We've got this interesting news here, courtesy of RA, regarding Berghain's agency, Oscott Booking, which is interesting. I'm not really sure what to read into this because I'm not really too familiar with how booking agencies work or, you know, um, the politics around it, how it works in the industry, whatnot. If the landscape is changed, I'm not really too sure. But this is interesting regardless because, obviously, Berghain being the premier club in the world to close an arm of their business seems a bit interesting. But anyway, it continues. It says here, staff will continue to work at a Berlin-based company until the end of the year. Um, sources confirmed that the news of resident advisor earlier today, eight people will be made redundant when the agency shuts at the end of 2022. It's unclear what will happen to the 20X on the roster. So first off, um, my condolences goes to anybody who was working at Oscott Booking. Um, it's obviously, you know, sad to lose your job anytime. It doesn't matter if it's a scene job, if it's a core job, it doesn't matter if it's a job working in a fucking local supermarket. Anytime you get made redundant when it's not your own decision, it's definitely something hard to take and definitely puts a lot of pressure on you to find another place in order for you to be able to pay your rent and keep a roof over your head. But I've always found for myself, usually, um, it gets it's really bad at the beginning, but usually the, but the only comforting thing I think that can come from it is that you know that it can't get any worse. Right, somebody decided, or not, in terms of job wise, other things can happen in terms of your life, but in terms of the job wise, being made redundant is the worst it's going to be. So you just have to kind of hope that you can ride through or ride over or ride along that wave of uncertainty and doubt and then get to the other side. That's all you need to do, really. That's all you need to do. Um, it continues to, and plus, as well, if you've got Berkane on your CV list, I'm sure that will maybe help in terms of you finding other occupations, maybe in the same space or changing career, regardless of maybe. If it was me, I'd change career though because just because of how i've seen the clubbing landscape i feel like you know things have never really gone back to how it ever was and again I've, this is somebody who's been to Berkheim what three times since the pandemic ended or since the restrictions got lifted and even i can say as an avid fan of the place as you guys know from my reviews it's not as popping as it was pre-pandemic and i've only been going what the last seven years or something maybe 10 years or something like that and people have been going for far longer than i have so if i can recognize there's a shift in terms of the vibe and the overall fullness of the place and imagine people who've been going there since the early 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 times 
Anyway, it continues. Oscar Bookimish represents Ben Clock, Steffi, Marcel Dietman and more. Launched 15 years ago. Five artists, um, Sadif Adassi, um, Nati Sears, Jacko Jacko, Fadi Moham and Lukuti joined earlier this year. Yeah, exactly. They made a big deal about it because they're all residents. Um, and they announced it. All well, the interviews of last arm of Bergen's operation to close following the label. Oscar turned in December for the 16 years. The outlet was dominant force in dust music, beloved for this mix series of dozen EPs and albums. His final release was 16th for the Veggie Cup on the compilation, which was called, or the that name is the the, the correction the previous of the article the, the, it was not 15 okay cool so time to speculate so the only thing that i'm kind of speculating about that's kind of throwing me off is that recently they made a big song and dance and usually i don't feel like they did this no, no they did actually i'm, I'm lying because i remember them posting it on their facebook instead they'll post like a detailed thing when they had a new resident but i felt like they made, obviously with social media now but they made a real big effort to announce their new flipping um, resident DJs who they had on board, right? Sidif Adassi, Nati Sirius, Jacko Jacko, Freddie Moham and Lakuti. Uh, it was like a big deal. These guys have finally made it to be resident DJs. They'll be playing there every single week, or, you know, willing there with them, um, as long as they're willing uh, or, this, or the kind of calendar permits them to. So if they're closing the booking arm of it, which would be the booking agency that would be booking them to play other places too. Um, so if you were to play, get these guys to play in your place, you'd go or oh, contact the booking, obviously then it might mean that either they're going to just have them all be integrated with Weinberg kind of rules. It's not like a separate thing. So it's all going to be maybe in-house in like a terms of under the Berkheim umbrella. So it's like you're booking a Berkheim resident, you have to kind of email, you know, info at Berkheim or info at, you know, or sorry, bookings at Berkheim.com, whatever it may be. Or this might mean that they got them on board as like a, as like a kind of just kind gesture to make because they love what they did and they went to give them a boost in terms of allowing them to get more gigs but the plan was always to have them be residents but then have their own representation in terms of booking because they don't have the resources or the time to do the booking side because i'd imagine running a club day to day especially in the post-pandemic world even though it's not as full as they are i guess the operations behind it with dealing with you know regulations and all this red tape stuff is probably more difficult than it was prior i'd imagine so things have gone a bit tighter in terms of the supply supply chain in terms of getting stuff in you know brexit all this shit right i'm sure it's affected it so maybe they have so much on their plate they'd rather not have a separate booking agency and run the club also so they're just gonna say hey get rid of the booking agency you guys have your own agents anyway which are kind of managers sometimes right some people have managers that get them shows some people have agents that get them shows so the line can be blurred in that terms of represent you know maybe just representation but if you're a bigger person you may be signed to a talent management company overall and they you know can look after all that stuff so maybe they're like you know we're seeing it change we're seeing artists come to us who want to play who have no representation some have you know a group representation whatever it may be we're wasting our time doing this let them just find themselves who they want to represent and then we will deal with that person that way instead of kind of doing that whole thing that they're doing maybe that's the thing the only other thing i could say is that maybe this is an indication that Berghain is looking to sell or looking for investment later on down the line that's like a classic thing most companies do, right? They kind of cut the fat before they kind of go public or they kind of go for a round of fat, uh, fundraising, sorry. You try and get rid of as much as you can, as much lean meat as possible in order to ensure that um, you are going to be an appetizing proposition for people if they want to invest. So maybe again, like I said, this is just a pure rumor me speculating. Maybe there is something in the idea that they might be looking to sell the entirety of it or set up stake in it to kind of help them to get funding to you know keep salaries to pay people to keep the lights on for another year i'm not really too sure but you know even though it generates a lot of money i still make i still think it kind of requires a lot to kind of keep it ticking over and like i said because i've definitely seen a dip in terms of the attendances there um a big i think the big op real test of that place would definitely be the new year's eve or the club Sylvester coming up for this january the, the one i went to which was a makeup one that happened in you know the middle of the year was whatever it was um but the actual real one that's going to happen in january or this you know through to december through to january i think that'll be a real test of where the club is actually in real life like do people care are people actually making that pilgrimage to go over there to go celebrate club sylvester and do new year's eve everything countdown all that sort of stuff or are they going to just stay where they are and do their own thing 
that's going to be the real test. But regardless, um, big up everybody that's on the list anyway in general on the agency. Big up everybody that's going to be made redundant. You'll find your feet eventually. But I'm going to keep my eye on this and see what I go on because it's very interesting news uh, for a place that doesn't necessarily have many things in terms of its business stuff happen. I mean, it just kind of slowly ticks over and keeps it moving. It's like a really efficient flipping Volkswagen. Do you know what I mean? It just keeps going and going and going. So the fact that this has kind of happened is... Some course of caution, but nothing too crazy. You know what I mean? Nothing too crazy. So, apart from that, let's move on into the best news of the day. All the stuff happening with Kanye, of course, isn't it? Let's touch upon that because I thought that was the best and most interesting thing that we can talk about regarding all this stuff because it's been a pretty much a bit of a whirlwind, I think, overall um, in terms of it. Let me just see if I can type, type in the third thing. Da -da -da. Let's see if I can get this up here, see if it works. Uh, bu -bu 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 -bu. Oh, here we go. <laughs> let's, let's do this one. Let's let's grab this one and go first, and then we're going to go through the rest of them, because I think the rest are really, really funny to their, in their own way. You know what I mean? They're probably not funny to you, the person checking this, and people, the people that are involved, they probably don't find it funny in the slightest, but I think um, they are still quite funny in this own weird way. Hopefully the page loads waiting for it to load now because my computer's a bit weird but waiting for it to load hopefully it's going to continue without disabling accept all cool let's move on there so let's jump on the shit straight away and let's talk about this so it looks like Kanye has officially changed his mind on the whole um, ASAP Rocky has fucked Yoon from ambush allegation that he threw out there in the midst of his tailspin that he's been on we all weekend or maybe all week it feels like maybe it feels like it's been longer than that but regardless he's kind of recanted it in the most typical Kanye way possible and it's absolutely hilarious for obviously us watching it as viewers and kind of keen observers but for the people involved it must be absolutely hell you know I mean he's creating all these uh, you know arguments and debates behind the scenes and breaking up friendships or putting friendships and relationships into question it's for all our entertainment but the people involved are probably having you know a really difficult time you'd imagine kind of dealing with it, especially when you kind of consider his influence and how people treat him and all this sort of stuff it just can be maybe a little bit frustrating but regardless Let's talk about it. So this is courtesy of um, the Nerd Stash, and it says Kanye West rethinks Yoon and um, and ASAP Rocky sex allegation, and obviously it's got him basically saying in the new post that he put on Instagram that I think got deleted, um, which said the following: new confirmation, Rocky didn't fuck Yoon. Ambush still trash. I know Yoon and Verbal before Tremendous was ever around. Rule with Ye and stay out of it unless you want to get into it. Um, cause all y'alls have out of it when my Chi was also when Chi was kidnapped on her birthday, which is absolutely hilarious. Now, if you're not familiar with this, if you're not aware, I think the only crime Yoon from Ambush committed in the eyes of Kanye West was that she dared to like the post that Tremaine made, which essentially called him out for his own hypocrisy, which basically said, you know, hey, you're talking all this bit talk and stuff but you were never invited to Virtual Abdul's funeral for a very specific reason and you don't want to let anybody know this because you know it makes you look bad and now due to Kanye basically spiraling since then and not really ever addressing he didn't actually ever say why he was never invited he said some things which I'll speak about later about not knowing that he when Virgil had cancer um, that's what he basically alleges and stuff but he hasn't really been direct in terms of answering um, Tremaine Emery's kind of or Tr Tremaine Emery I keep calling it Emery Tremaine Emery's questions rhetorical or not about why he wasn't invited instead what he ended up doing was obviously attacking Hailey Bieber attacking Gigi Hadid and it's all kind of been dis to distract away from the core point which is that allegation or that kind of you know assumption that flipping uh, assertion sorry that Tremaine put out there would essentially paint Kanye in a really bad light because we all kind of believed the the kind of smoke and mirrors that Virgin and Kanye were brothers and even though they went through this bad patch in time where maybe Kanye was jealous that Virgil getting the job before him and stuff and they fell out because of it they patched things up as they did in that famous runway picture where they hugged and stuff and since then they've been pretty much cool well, I guess that wasn't the case, according to what Tremaine said. And Yoon decided to like the, the tweet or the Instagram post, which was fairly universally recepted really well, um, because I guess it called into question Kanye's own hypocrisy and revealed some background stuff that we didn't know as fans from the outside and kind of basically 
reaffirm to people like myself who maybe pay more attention than the average person that everything that most people have said about Kanye has always been true. He's always been a bit of a cunt. He's always been a bit of a prick, but his friends around him who were benefiting the most from it at the time, from going to shows and going to listing parties and getting free shoes, they kept telling us we were bugging and that we didn't actually get him when the whole time he was always consistent and always this bit of a cunt, but now he's kind of done this, you know, um, right wing grift shift and a bit of a heel turn this obviously have upset them because they're mostly ideologically possessed and politically obsessed so they can't really get with it but he's always kind of been the same person maybe his obviously ideologies and political beliefs and social beliefs have changed somewhat but as a human he's always been at his core like this i don't think you suddenly turn into the cunt where you're airing out all your friends dirty laundry to the public this is always something that you've done in some element so her only crime was to like that, which everyone kind of said to some level of truth. And then Kanye decided to go at her by just basically doing what Kanye does best, where kind of belittling the thing that you know you cherish the most. Because I think deep down he has a lot of mean girl energy. He's that kind of like, I kind of think of him like a, a kind of male version of Nicki Minaj, right? Who has, I think, the ability to like tear you apart with her words, right? She could say something to you that will kind of sit with you forever. And I think Kanye's got the same sort of power, especially with him being a creative himself or being an artist or working in fashion design. He knows the things that designers are insecure about. So he's probably had conversations with Yoon about her being, you know, not too sure about her brand and about where it sits. Because even myself, full disclosure, I'm not the biggest fan of Ambush. I think it's very um, meh in the middle of the road. It kind of jumps around from different themes every collection hasn't really have an identity and i think if anything doesn't really add anything to the current conversation we have in fashion but still she seems pretty unproblematic keeps herself to herself does her clothes keeps her moving but i'm sure in some past life when they were friends and they used to hang around each other i'm sure Eunice shared that she maybe doesn't feel the most confident with her brand and obviously Kanye would use that to weaponize it to then kind of attack her back so that was obviously a low blow and then of course playing on the whole notion or playing on the thing that, you know, Yoon was a video girl for Asa Brocky once back in the day when he filmed the video for LSD and they had a really intimate kiss in the video and that was it, which was like a random video. But I guess Kanye is playing on that or maybe he used to wank to it, I don't know. And re-mentioning it so many years later down the line when Rocky's in relationship, he's got a kid with Rihanna, the kid's just been born, like just unnecessary nonsense. And, you know, he probably caused a lot of upset around them in their household and whatnot, you can just imagine. And then now here he comes with this kind of fluffy kind of half apology, half explanation for why I was being a cunt. Like, I'm apologising, but here's why I said what I said. So basically not apologising. And um, and basically maybe reaffirming that, because I, I actually thought they got divorced. I thought they went together because I've not seen pictures of Union and Verbal together in a while. Don't get me wrong, I don't really check for them that much, but I've not seen, because I remember they used to always be around fashion shows and shit. They get taking pictures of uh, shows and whatnot. So you don't usually see pictures of them together too tough. So I thought maybe they'd split. And obviously he's confirming in his own way that they haven't. And he just put the room out of there just to be a cunt. Or even if they have fucked, it's none of our business. Ultimately, it's none of our business. It does nothing. Because they're two, I would say, especially with Yoon, she's quite a relatively private person. Yeah, I know she's very fine, she's a designer, but she's not out there with her business. You know what I mean? So it's like, it's a bit unfair. And I actually, funnily enough, I actually got to meet her once. Um, but again, at previous job I was at where I was design, putting together designing, helped to co-produce a streetwear program. I tried to get her involved in the streetwear course but she didn't want to do it at the time because I think she was very particular about her image, which I probably she probably still is, about how she positions her brand and her personal brand, her brand, her personal brand. And I think that was a major stipulation. Well, from what I can remember, because I think we met her in a pub. And what I remember first off is that she had... Um, um, what do I remember first off? About her? Oh, she had a very... Sti I would say stinky, but she, she had a very, like, standoffish face. But it was just how to, that's just how she looks. Um, but she's very attentive. I felt like very kind, very nice, very easy to talk to. But the first thing you notice about her is that she got that kind of like, what's this motherfucker gonna say? She got that kind of face in real in real life. But I found her to be really pleasant and really nice, which is why when I saw him attack, I was like, come on, man. She seems like a real like lady. Like, you know what I mean, why would you attack someone like that? She just doesn't seem like she bothers anybody. So clearly that was maybe something that we don't really know about personally wise. And then, you know, she decided to post some other stuff as well, kind of getting back at him a little bit, kind of felt a little bit, you know, unnecessary. And just in general, you know, somebody that was just minding their business, doing their thing, having to post these kind of like, you know, back to business, back to office, back to business, operate always or a place of high vibrancy tweet, picture things. And then you see the picture of her, like, you know, 
we all know what that looks like you know we all know what that is behind the eyes you know i mean she's still probably a little bit cut up about the whole thing and i think it's just unfair in general do you know what i mean like he's a real beef is with whatever he's beefing with bernard i know alexander i know uh lvmh in general corporate america jp morgan well, whoever's beefing with those is real enemy but going after someone like this who had literally nothing to do with it because they dared to agree with a point that everyone else agreed with it's just really low and i'm sure there were many people on that list of likes that he saw that he didn't air out so he was definitely being picky about who he's airing out people he knows he can go to war with who he could kind of quote unquote bury um and the other thing i said before as i mentioned which i didn't share on here because you know i don't want to encourage that nonsense but when i was checking for her page when it first happened when he first said what he said god damn it bruv the comments were brutal some guys were like saying oh yeah like verbal is a flipping asian will smith um you've broken up a household like they were attacking her the same way do you remember when that fucking guy on twitter decided to leak the news or share the news that wasn't true that well according to them it wasn't true we don't know if it was, was true but the news that kind of thingy majiggy that rocky had them um, cheated with some stylist that rihanna had or something like that and um no one knew if it was true or not but her name got put out there and then obviously rihanna fans who don't like rocky anyway for whatever reason decided to go and attack that woman and her comments were getting flooded with you know with flipping navy i guess as us rihanna's fans right going after her to a point where she had to kind of lock down her account and that's the same thing you saw happening to unicount she was just getting flooded in the comments of like all of kanye's kind of trolls and stands and whatever just saying the most meanest things possible to kind of get the most up likes and whatnot it was just a bit horrible to watch so even if it wasn't just a little jibe to kind of get back at somebody because you felt like they shouldn't be in a place to say something to you because they you know them for ages the ramification of it's one little jibe bloody hell bruv like honestly really really brutal so that's how that ended anyway with you and ambush um kanye kind of clarified it in the most kanye way possible um which wasn't really clarifying it in all actuality and probably he's done already enough damage already as it is but hey that's an apology you're going to get from a minute so i guess you have to kind of take that one um how you can take it really for the most part and then moving on from that we need to talk about this which i think for me is uh one of the biggest parts of this whole story that i'm still trying to get my head around so somehow off the back of all this nonsense that's happened right somehow off the back of this we've now got this kind of ongoing beef that's now occurring between ian connor and flipping asap bari and you know, ian connor obviously being the guy that's kind of very closely linked with asap and asap mob and asap rookie and whatnot he's got his own brand that he does as well called sicko before that he had revenge called revenge x storm not too sure if he does that still but still somebody quite linked with that whole world of people and asap Bari, of course he's the founder um of loan and obviously he's part of asap mob 2 and one of you know all those guys friends and i think you'd remember those two specifically for that famous video of virgil doing some sort of um signing i think for something during fashion week at colette and they're all signing stuff and then Furfus london is there who at the time i guess had some sort of beef with ian connor they're going back and forth in the store ian connor tries to steal or kind of sneak up on Furfus as he's turned his back it doesn't go too well the security jumps in barry i guess at that time was going through a beef with ian connor i remember because Ian was kept trying to let him ask him on social media to forgive him i don't know something happened with i don't know what happened ian, barry sees ian connor try to punch fear first london and he goes over to back fear first london and then you know or also so an excuse for him to basically put his hands on barry on ian because he never liked him they end up fighting and it kind of spills over to the outside and whatnot and this whole to the whole time is happening for whatever reason um you know but uh virgil has his back to the door where this is all going on and he just ke keeps on signing stuff like yeah well, what name did you want like do you know what i mean consummate professional in the midst of all of that he just kept on his job kept signing kept doing what he was doing and i'm sure after that happened they all kind of probably said the individual sorries to him to kind of you know make sure that he you know he didn't think it was anything untoward they just kept him moving but that was a really funny video you would have maybe seen between all of them but anyway off the back of all of that somehow um yeah, for some reason what did what did happen again oh that's how it happened so i guess somebody shared a dm with uh it looks like tremaine and he's going back and forth i think maybe with ian connor about bari or something and um they say something like oh because i think at the time i don't know what it was something happened anyway but whatever happened it got revealed that flipping what's his name that bari doesn't actually own vlone are you guys aware of this 
I think this is a screenshot here I'm showing on Twitter from Fashion Demics. Ian Connor exposes that ASAP Barry for getting kicked out of his own brand Vlone. So this whole time, this brand Vlone that's intrinsically think linked to flipping ASAP Barry, like it or lump it, you know it's linked to this short, fat, stubby, bearded guy who wears loads of expensive clothes very, very badly. You know it's linked to him, right? Even if you don't like the clothes, you know it's linked to him. You remember the jacket with a V, the T-shirt with a V, the jeans with all those slashes and shit. You know that kind of style of clothes, right? That kind of trap, um, that trap fashion chic thing that they all have going on where they patch up jeans and put trainers on and weird, all weird colours and patterns all together at once. Loads of boot cut flare jeans, all that kind of good stuff. But he's obviously does it to a really high level. And you always kind of see him going around the, the country, doing a pop-up stores and pop-up shops and activations and collaborations with artists for their albums and whatnot. It's become like a well-oiled machine. And again, you just link it to Bari. So to hear this news was to me quite mind-boggling because I had no idea this was true. So because I guess Bari was running around with Virgil, sorry, running around, sorry, with Kanye during this whole ordeal that he's doing where he's spinning out of control, the main Vlone account decided to post this, which says, Vlone is a stamp for creatives who stand and tour and thriving on individuality caring less about conformity uh, that has been governed um, the fashion style of society create your own style rules um just set your own trend embed your own morale in which you express yourself creatively without limitations in the new era of loan our brand will embrace distinctive creatives who defy the norm and inspire the willing in closing we will not be partaking or irrational behavior associated or related to Jabari, young Lord Shelton. He has no authority to style himself as Mr. Flown, use or license Flown. This behavior is contrary to our collective. So out of the blue, it looks like he got kicked out of his own brand, you know, in the same way that, you know, John Galliano did back in the day or, you know, Alexander McQueen or whatever. We didn't kick out, but you know what I mean? So that was pretty crazy to kind of see as a revelation happen kind of randomly in the timeline. And then, of course, we've got the filings of like, the company that owns actual loan basically um, attacking a uh, young Lord Jabari Shelton for his use of the trademark, which they feel like he doesn't have a right to. Um, which obviously they explain here on Vlone.grails. It says this suit claims against Jabari Shelton for unauthorized use of the Vlone mark and claims that Shelton has entered into contract to license the mark of the several prominent rap and hip hop performers. And then of course they continue to saying LDV Holdings is registered to uh, but the, oh, it's uh, Hunter Bear to some other person, as you can see there. But essentially, I had no idea the guy didn't fucking own his own brand, especially some a brand that I feel like, for the most part, doesn't look like it would need excessive investment. Sometimes brands, I feel like, get you know swept. Sometimes brands, I feel like, sometimes no designers, I feel like, can get duped into selling off their brand because they're in a tight space or because they are looking to jump to the next level to take their career to the next level. So if you want to do that, and you want to start going global. You want to start maybe expanding into different territories, um, sorry, different areas of design. You want to maybe just change up what you're doing or keep it moving. Getting more investment could actually be a good thing to do. But then, of course, it can end up you having to give away more of the pie. But if you're a brand like Vlone that I feel like, for the most part, doesn't do a lot of manufacturing or R&D in terms of it. I don't know. It's just it doesn't feel like you would need to have that level of investment where you'd kind of you know, sell off the trademark or sell off the license or the intellectual property of it. It doesn't really make any sense. So that's why when I heard that, I was like, fuck, you know, like, you know, you make it probably a lot because, you know, the shirts to manufacture are probably cheap, but then the retail price is super high. So, the you know, the, the markup is crazy, right? You can make a lot of profit off one T-shirt. So the fact that he's had to still raise money is maybe a point for concern. But I have learned through re doing my research that Edison Chen also earns a percentage of loan as well. So it's not always, never really been fully in his control at all in the slightest. But that's pretty nuts to see. And off the back of that, I think there was a really interesting um, tweet that flipping Ian Connor put out because obviously he wanted to put the boot in because he's had a long running beef with Bari. And he's people the following. He said, Bari owes the government $8 million, which might explain why he needed the investment. Sued by LVMH for another, million and is on his last he better make those yay blow jobs the sloppiest he could ever get because his world as we know it is going to come slowly come into a standstill oh and you and how you go from a boss to a mere worker 
So, so as you can see here, Ian Connors alleging he owes the government $8 million in unpaid taxes. Now, that could just be something that he didn't do on purpose because I feel like it happens a lot in the States. People, of you know, or just in business in general, people hire accountants and whatnot to do their books and sometimes they end up stealing from them, which obviously we've heard the story from Fat Joe and stuff, or they just end up not being really on top of it to the point where you'll start building up and accruing all this money. And usually the government, it feels like, don't don't step in when it's $100 or 1000 the they accrue to an obscene level of an amount and then come and collect when they want to collect because they know you have to give it if you want to be a functioning adult and you want to avoid going to jail or prison and whatnot so it's a pretty sick game and then to be sued by Louis v LVMH is a bit weird I wonder what that's all about maybe it's tied into the fashion show he did in Paris back in the day that was really good I thought that can kind of show that he had the capabilities of maybe doing more but that didn't happen obviously because that happened and then I think soon after that is when the whole video leaked of him slapping that girl's bum in a hotel room who said she didn't want to be touched and it continues to says oh and da, da, da. so that was obviously a revelation of solving itself right the guy's money so that might explain why he ended up having to sell off a bit of his brand but it's kind of sad to see i'm not gonna lie again if not as i was not a fan of the brand itself i'm not really the biggest fan of him in general i don't really care to stuff i just follow him from afar just to see what he's up to but it's not something that keeps me up at night but just to see somebody who built something from the scratch it felt like to then be in a position where it's no longer something that he can call his anymore and he has to just kind of make do what he has to make do i think that's really really sad personally and then on the back of that to make even matters even worse there's now a feud happening between young lord and flipping tremaine emery from obviously supreme and which is sad to see from afar again because as much as i kind of like to see these guys worlds burn because i feel like a lot of them have kind of lived in this kind of fake existence where everyone kind of pretends they're friends and pretends everyone's a coolest when really the, the the kind of the truth of it is that they all hate each other behind their back they're all jealous they're all backstabbing each other um they're all fucking each other's girlfriends and wives and shit as being rumored and just doing loads of messy stuff and usually us the punters and the customers and stuff who are from on the outside who only get limited information because they purposely don't say certain things we still have a good read on them we can still tell who's who what's what and what what they're actually like and usually we haven't been wrong in our overall assessments of what we've seen so it's cool to kind of not cool it's fun to see them suffer like real life consequences in a, in a way a real life person will suffer in terms of being called out on the internet going back and forth of text and stuff it's just kind of that but it's also sad because I have someone to pay attention to it. I know how much Tremaine was bigging up Bari. Like he, he's the one that was kind of trying to legitimize Bari in the in the sort of like contemporary art world, in the fashion world, in like a serious design artist world. Even though Bari probably didn't really care, he was trying to say, "Now this guy might be rough around the edges, but he's definitely got it. He's definitely somebody that gets it as well. He's definitely about this life." And to see them now become mortal enemies off the back of this whole thing is just horrible because this is basically a Kanye wave, really. That's kind of you know rumbled on so this is him posting a screenshot taking a clip i guess of a screenshot of another picture that i guess you know somebody else uploaded showing ambush um youth ambush sitting on his lap i guess or something or hugging him and some other people in the shot and on the top of his face he says you aids face nigga which is fucking horrendous but also i think i said before another post that it's a common adage people say but they always yeah i think the common adage people say where they say that you should always be cautious of what your friends say to you when they're angry because usually those are their real feelings about you as a person. Sometimes if your friend is a friend friend, they won't want to say what they actually think about you when they're angry. They will just walk away, keep it to themselves or even won't make it a hint, it just kind of keep it moving. But if somebody kind of, as soon as the first point of a disagreement or an argument or a bit of conflict, they, they go for the juggling just start talking saying stuff about you that you would never think they'll say you know you spot dick motherfucker or whatever it may be those are somebody you should definitely make sure that you make an effort to not be their friend in the long term because that definitely means there's definitely some envy jealousy and plotting going on in the background so you know as much as this is sad to see it's probably good for him to know because he knows okay this guy never fucks with me anyway so that's definitely so one thing and off the back of it he continued and latched onto the whole tremendous thing that Kanye had going on by by posting a picture of the box logo that got made in double quick time which looks like with a pretty decent sized box too it looks like they actually measured the proportions sorry the kind of size of the dimensions of the box logo and kind of made it fit similar with the same font and it says bitch made tremendous nigga you 40 and only date white women 
which is a weird flipping dish to put to somebody. But I guess if he's trying to kind of twist a knife in and say, hey, you're this kind of freedom fighter guy, which I think someone, who did someone call him in the comments? Uh, someone called him in the comments like streetwear Marcus Garvey or something, which is incredibly insulting, isn't it? You try to uplift your community. You try to make something that people can be, can rally behind in terms of the reef jeans. I feel like they're just pretty cool. It's much better than um, that bag that was going flipping viral during the beginning of the pandemic that had like abolished systematic racism or something like that. It's like, excuse me? Oh, I don't want that on my handbag. Like, you know, it just feels a weird thing. So if you want to do something that kind of, you know, plays on that, I think what I mentioned previously was the one. But anyway, bitch made. Da -da -da. Um, obviously sorry the rich jeans were definitely the one in that respect the next screen shot from a story says hey you're tremendous you're turning 50 right now so first he's so first he's 40 and then there's white women now he's 50 so his, they, his years keep changing but again this is another kind of illustration of the obsession with youth these kids have when they're coming up they think for whatever reason that they're, no, they're also not going to get old they're always going to be like in like 20s or 30s it's like crazy anyway it says here you're tremendous you're turning 50 right now the fuck you ain't got no more money than me again unnecessary and a dumb insult because from what i can tell you know tremaine's not really operating dead in tears or the fuck stuff he does as a way to attain wealth and buy like a, men a flipping penthouse mansion in miami it looks like he just wants to partake he's always wanting to be involved and be an artist in his own way and this is his ways of doing it by having these different sort of vessels that he can use to sort of present his ideas but i don't think it's like a brand where he's trying to get stocked everywhere in all the right places and sell it out which obviously barry keeps more attention to but again you know, these guys, they pretend like they're friends, but really behind the scenes, they never, never were friends. Another one, it says Tremendous sucked Tre Mark Jacobs' dick, which I'm not sure if that's real or if that's fake. And if it is real, that's also gross. It's posing that about him. It says, the other one says, I'm the fucking Tupac of this fashion. Whatever I fucking do, you niggas do. I'm the fucking sensei of this shit. And I'm only fucking 30 years old, which is interesting for you to say, because I don't think he's a sensei or at all. Sensei, sorry. Maybe there was a time period where you had the opportunity to do so. Like I said, that Paris Fashion Week show that he did, there was a golden time there where I thought, wow, this guy has potential. He could go places. But after that, he's fallen off. He's gone for the easy money, really, for the most part. Um, doesn't really challenge himself artistically. I feel like at all and now we're where we're at it we are where we're at but yeah that's that's the beef between um flipping young lord and Tremaine emery happening now at the moment um i'm not just sure it's probably ended already because you know it's a bit one-sided because everyone else is basically stum and not wanting to say more before they attract the attention of kanye and whatnot but overall it's a sucky thing to see um unfortunate but it is bill illuminating to find out that flipping barry doesn't own flipping flown it's absolutely mind-blowing to think that's a situation that was allowed to happen man absolutely crazy but yeah hopefully everyone heals from this or going forward hopefully everyone heals from this going forward next we have to talk about what we talk about here we've done that we've done that da, da, da. oh let's yeah let's talk about let's talk about Tremaine and stuff so we need to update on the last occasion so as the last occasion as i mentioned previously Tremaine kind of set the world on light or set Kanye's world on light when he kind of aired him out and basically said hey tell the world why you weren't invited to virgil's funeral and basically gave the assumption that Kanye was specifically told by the family not to come to a private funeral because I guess at that time he was still not on good terms with, with Virgil and they had heard everything that would happen before behind the scenes so they didn't want him anywhere near that funeral and then of course he never really responded to it he then started arguing with these white girls and Gigi Hadid and Bally Beaver and just kind of avoid the smoke with Tremaine I guess it was eating away at him because I was saying on my Twitter and other places, why isn't this guy attacking these Tremaine as much as he's tracking everybody else? Why is he kind of being selective in his responses? Because the world wants to know, like, if this is true about you, then you are a real piece of shit because your friend was dying of a terminal illness and here you are stressing about designs and what look book looked the best and who did what. It's just obscene. So I guess... Um, it was eating away at Kanye and he decided to pick up the phone and text Tremaine and then post it on Instagram because that's what he loves to do, right? He's a consummate guy that loves to do, kind of share every private conversation he has with people online because why not? So it says as follows, this is Tremaine, I guess, reaching out to him maybe, I don't know, I'm too sure. Like I said before, Kanye's got a weird thing, either he doesn't have a lot of people saved on his phone or he might just do a thing where he's got this OCD where when he finishes talking to you on text, he deletes the whole chain. He deletes the whole thing he just goes right swipes left delete and then keeps it moving maybe that's the thing that he does because every time he puts a screenshot there's not a lot of bubbles it's just like it's just some people he's speaking to you've only spoken to for the first time now 
which is bizarre. Anyway, continues. The screenshot here shows Tremaine name. I guess his syntax is in yay, and it says, you still ain't tell the people why you weren't invited to Virgil's private funeral. Why you rode on him when you knew he was sick? That's the ether. That's the shit that can't you can't address. That's the shit you can't live with. All that hate you spewed on your brother. Kanye responds. Good to hear from you, you bitch. I hate it virtual designs and di and you did too. If you loved his design so much, why you and Luke are not wearing it head to toe? Christine, I Christine told me he didn't have cancer, and I believed her. So clearly there's a lot to unpack from there, but the good to hear from you, you bitch, might be one of the best opening lines I've ever seen in my entire life. And I'm sure a lot of people are going to be stealing that for their own sort of like, you know, personal enjoyment and whatnot. The other line about Virgil's designs, again, is mute and unnecessary to say, especially now, considering, you know, this was just a few days after his birthday, if he was still around, he's, you know, he's one year anniversary of his death is coming up very, very soon. It just felt really, really tasteless to be like, yeah, um, you know, you didn't like his designs and whatnot and argue about it. Because that's not important, because I think most people, sensible friends, sensible people, um, you know, critical critiques out there right critical critically thinking like based for critiques can say and agree that yes we all know the guy wasn't a super talented designer you know we, he wasn't fucking alexander mcqueen he's heyday we are aware of this but the one thing that he did offer i feel like at the time was a a, a sort of example that it could be done because he was obviously not everyone's cup of tea the fact that he could do it should give everybody hope that they could do it too in their own way but people are so stubborn and people are so flipping um what's that insistent that they always get the flipping right package of person to come along that they kind of dismiss that and say oh no but he wasn't going to design so it doesn't really matter but i think that was never the point the point was to say look it can be done here's me also doing it at record speeds with many different games going at the same time, multi, 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 multitasking, but I'm still absolutely smashing it. So that's basically, I think, his legacy in that regard. But, you know, maybe I'm wrong. It continues. Um, of course, the White Luca thing, same thing. I think I mentioned this myself actually prior. When, again, these guys are like this all the time. When people were attacking Virgil, and basically saying that he needs to come harder with his designs, I remember one of the things that they would basically say back in retort to us, was like, oh, yeah, no, oh, no, his house is done, how you just don't get it. They will be like, hold on, okay, let's imagine we don't get it, but why are none of your friends or none of his friends wearing it? Why are none of them posting images of them going to the store and buying the newest jacket or whatnot? They don't do that. They will just wait for freebies or this kind of stuff, but no one's really supporting it the same way they support other brands that they wear day to day. So clearly, the interpretation you get from that is that people don't really rate the clothes as much as they say they do or pretend like they do. So that's something that I feel like is a low blow because I guess other people could be applied to as well. Next screenshot says, Tremaine to back to Kanye again. He says, nigga, I told you he had cancer. You are so full of shit. Um, Kanye responds back to Tremaine and says, Virgil never said anything to me himself, which again is a narcissistic thing, right? Someone has to come and tell you something. Um, I spent the most time of my life with my mom, second most time with Kim, third most time with Virgil. I only hired you because LVMH took Virgil and I love the way you dress and I miss you. <laughs> this passive aggressive sort of like indirect fucking thing is really hilarious that they're going through. And he says, I told you, I see you flying everywhere on by Chicago to check in, check in on him. Rotted, rotted. So basically he's saying that Kanye was going everywhere but Chicago. So he wasn't going back home. It's like a double entendre. He wasn't going back home or visiting his friends. And he says, yeah, no, you fired Virgil, he says, right? Virgil worked in for himself for years before the Louis job. You and no one, you and no one else destroyed Jesus Christ. So th that's something we didn't know. Kanye actually fired Virgil before he took his job at Louis Vuitton. So he's actually jobless and doing all that stuff he was posting on Instagram, which I guess must have been just like freelance stuff that he was kind of getting on top of. And it continues. It says here, um, I've made mistakes. I screamed at Virgil. I was jealous of Virgil. I felt betrayed and lied to by Virgil. I felt he gave Drake the green diamond watch just to fuck with me. <laughs> I love how he makes everything about himself, innit? He's the consummate narcissist, man. Literally everything is happening to him because of him. It's never just things happening on their own. Isolation, coincidence, doesn't exist. It's just all attack, attack, attack. It says here, it continues, but I love Virgil too and I miss him and I miss my family and one thing I wanted to say and would have said at the funeral would be I've been to directly ASAP. I saw Rocky sitting on one side of the funeral and I saw her Bari sitting on the other side. What is he talking about here? This, this conversation started with Tremaine being very clear and saying this, 
you still haven't told the people why you weren't invited to the private funeral. And now it's divulged into, um, what you call it, Kanye basically talking about why he felt, you know, explaining he screamed at Virgil and all this stuff and nonsense about Drake's screen watch. It's really bizarre. Um, he says, yeah, but I saw Rocky and Barry now sit in the funeral and I just wanted to grab the mic and say, don't let the people split you gang up like they did mine. I'm a leader. The, the, why does he hate punctuation so much? Not a comma or full stop to be found anywhere. I wonder if he thinks that's like a lover level of mind control. Maybe he went and did his Googles and found out that fucking question marks and punctuation marks and fucking full stops and paragraphs were flipping created by some person from the third reich no not further from the kkk or something because third reich you know he might have a bit of a soft spot for it but you know what i mean it's so weird anyway it continues don't let people split you up don't let people split up your gang like they did mine i'm a leader and rocky is a leader see it says that's a, i love how he, he insults his friends without realizing it so barry's out there fighting his battles from him backing him and being you know a contribute your yay kind of bodyguard not body right yay right hand man in a way and then here he's basically telling the world that rocky's the main guy of ace up mob and you know barish just fall in line basically it's what he's kind of saying in a roundabout way which is hilarious to say the least it continues uh, your brothers come back together and get behind rock the way my gang was behind me at one point again he would want that one he want everyone just to be around him again like to, honestly the self-absorption or the lack of self-awareness is really frightening from that guy i'm not going to lie incredibly incredibly frightening and then i think i have a quick check here before i bounce that might be it you know oh no there's another one so the update no and then of course the update on that text was this which says um i guess this is your long-winded answer to to why you didn't get invited to your brother's funeral <laughs> which is hilarious and he says as follows it so he's my brother then we as people have lost the ability to have a farm ourselves. We all talk, we all take big jobs at white companies and whether you like fashion or not, Bernard is a genius, is genius, is in gene businesses, sorry. And he don't give a fuck about these posters, text messages. He owns real estate. And what do we own? Braids, the word nigger. <laughs> Honestly, what is this anything to do with what he's fucking being accused of? This is fucking bizarre, isn't it? Literally one of the wildest things you see happen in real time. It honestly is. This guy is fucking next level. Literally to me, next level. But I guess that might be it in terms of updating, in terms of that, right? Is there, is there anything more on that regard? I want to talk about the train and Virgil stuff. Um, oh, this is it. Let's continue here. I think I mentioned that, that right? Uh, where can I see it? Yeah, and then they continue arguing again here. Another text. Uh, this keeps going on and on, going on. Um, it says uh, here in real estate... Um, he says, yeah, we need Martin Rose, though, no cap. She the Oracle. Mix that with J Boogie Manufacturing. Mix that with farming and our own police force. And this is real culture. Thank you for reaching out. This was tremendous. <laughs> He's hilarious. Even the high in comments says, and, you're, and you hired me because I worked for Frank on Be a Blonde and Endless and Boys on Cry magazine. You know art, which is funny. The tremendous tea is about to go crazy, though. And then... Uh, uh, I also wanted to, and it continues to, I wanted to say also that I'm sorry to Shannon for for taking most of her husband's time from her and their kids. And thank you for letting me be around this amazing human for so long. My life is forever changed by Virgil, just as this was forever changed by mine as Christian. Tremaine, I'm sorry for always judging you for being an atheist because these texts have brought you out something in me that needed to express, but I couldn't find the worst until now. Thank you for thank you for that. You've been tremendous. He says, I'm actually agnostic. Big for difference, LOL. Which already, what, does this mean he's being funny or is he LOLing like, I wish, hope we can be friends again? Because this is proof again of why Kanye is where he is. These guys are fucking indulged him for so long to the point where he can get away with absolute murder. He can do whatever he wants, say whatever he wants and people just kind of, you know, ha ha he he afterwards. Personally, I think what the guy did and said about him isn't something you can ha ha about. That's something you need to kind of run a fade with. Like, let's step outside. No cameras, no nothing. Let's run a fade. You can't be talking to me like that. Let's, we have to fight. But the fact that this guy never fights and just does the Karen shit, he, which he did earlier with Diddy and fucking Boosie, you're going to be the two main people that are going to be, you know, under suspicion for her murdering me if you come off. Like, loads of Karen shit, but... You know, you can't be joking around somebody that said what he said, but anyway, maybe it's just me. It continues off one that says, um, it's a hard to find these real friends when you're walking, meal ticket. I love him as a friend and my brother. He says, uh, I love him as a friend and a brother. Uh, 
he loved me. The past few days have felt like an extension of Virgil's funeral. Like he spent oh, Virgil, honestly, let this man rest in peace, man. Like, God damn it, man. He's tarnishing his legacy, like, every time he mentions it because it's never anything really that good. It's always this weird backhanded compliment type things he's saying. Like, that he's happy to get off his chest. It's just weird. It seems as if the only... Um, he only came, sorry, he says here, the past few days I felt like an extension of Virgil said that he only came with love and only posted on the right thing, same as Kim and Drake, but he still passed. <laughs> I love how he despises people who just like want to just keep their head down and work and be not be bothered. That's now been a, that's like a bad thing for him. It's like, it's, what a weird guy. He said, we need more of these companies than we need to be black faces. We need tech factories in America, f talk water. Um, talk later said but you and Virgil and Drake and Kendrick and myself be giving a culture away to your company for free thank what's that thank bank thank bank of us herding our tribes in fucking absolutely lost it to the point where I can't even read these texts anymore like, he's still going which I guess is funny because you know Tremaine left him on red <laughs> at 6am in the morning like enough he says here LVMH bought Supreme which they haven't why does he keep saying that he keeps saying LVMH bought Supreme but they didn't if I'm not mistaken it's VF Corp right VF Corp. VF Corp buys Supreme. Yeah. Why does he keep saying it's LVMH then? Maybe he's trying to push something out there into the universe so it's, it's true. Or maybe he saw something online that might have said it. I'm not really too sure, but he's not letting go of this idea that LVMH bought fucking um, Supreme when they clearly didn't. Like, no, they did not. It was VF Corp that bought it. But hey, am I going to go up there and tell the guy that he's wrong? Obviously not. None of my business. Let them continue on with the madness. I can watch and enjoy. That's basically it. Let me see if I can get it. It's that one. Let's move this to the back a little bit. Let's see if it's that screenshot. What's that screenshot? Right? I also want to say thank you to the... the what's that one? Yeah, it's the one, yeah. Uh, there we go. So as you can see here, I'll first you the screen. It says VF Corp completes acquisition of Supreme. That's from 2020. So I don't know what um, that he's talking about. Maybe he means LVMH bought fucking VF Corp. I'm not really too sure. But still, it's a very interesting thing to see overall from them lot. And I think that might be the end of the text messages, right? Yeah, it is the end. Thank God it's the end. Because these guys are legitimately making my brain go spaz, 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 spaz. But yeah. Hopefully it gets fixed, maybe it won't, who knows, but it's entertaining to say the least, to watch it from afar, to watch it from afar. Anyway, that was Thanks for Show episode number, what, 607 I think, right? Thanks again for tuning in, it's been a pleasure to have your company, first time checking out the show, you know what to do, smash like, hit subscribe, leave a comment down below, um, if it's not your first time, you're just enjoying what you're hearing, you know what to do, just sit back, relax. Especially in the audio podcast version, you can hear the song of the day. If you're just watching for your video, you won't hear anything, and it'll just stop as per usual. But again, see you again soon, guys. Take care. Peace.